welcome to section 3, Array and Slices. In this section, we're going to be talking about how to declare and use arrays in lecture 1. In the next lecture, we're going to look at how to use arrays and function. That is, how to pass arrays to function and how to return arrays from function and the implication of doing so. Then we're going to talk about slices. Slices are very much like arrays and we can see how we're going to create slices from arrays and these the additional capabilities that slices give you especially when we get to slices and function which is the how do you pass slices to function how do you return slices from function the implication of doing that we're going to get into something i call cesc slices at runtime and all that is is a mouthful to say that we're going to look at how to create slices expand slices shrink slices and copy slices at runtime runtime simply means when your program is running and finally we're going to wrap up and that is going to be tying up any loose end anything that we left on the floor on purpose while we went through, you know, section one through five, and we're gonna pick up those things in the wrap up section. And then of course, look at the two labs that you're gonna have for this section. So with that said, let's jump in and take a look at what arrays are. It's about declaring and using arrays. So if you're new to arrays, we should set the landscape of what we plan to learn in this lecture. So in this lecture, we wanna understand what is an array. We wanna understand how to declare an array and how to store and retrieve values from an array. It wouldn't be any too useful if we can only put values in an array and couldn't get it out, or if all we can do is retrieve values, because then we wouldn't be able to put what we want into an array. We'll then look at how you calculate the length of an array. That can be useful if you do not know the length already. It'd be good to know what is the length of an array. And some of this might not make sense to you why we might be thinking of a length of an array right now, but you will see in a minute. And we'll talk about iterating of an array again, which might not make sense to you, but iteration simply means just visiting every element of an array. And if you've never been exposed to array, that still doesn't make any sense, but I wanna set the landscape, give you an idea of what we're gonna cover before we talk about it. Let's say I had some numbers. And so I have this number 12, and it doesn't really matter what it represents. It could be test score, it could be the number of some particular item in my inventory, and I had 53 to represent yet another number. Again, it could be test scores, it doesn't matter. But I have these numbers, and I have 10 of them. Now, without arrays, if I told you to store these number in your program, you'd have to do is say, these are my values I'm interested in, and I'll have to create a variable to store the first number. And let's say we call that variable x0. And maybe I call it x0 because I like counting from zero. Let's say that for now. And I call the next variable x1, and that stores the value 53. And x2, and it stores the values 86 and x3 store the value 94 and so on. Now I have 10 variables, each with different names. Even though the names are very similar, they have different names because they are storing values for different items, right? Whatever those numbers represent. Well, those are my variables. I have 10 of them. If I wanted to calculate the sum, for example, just a simple thing, that is gonna look like x0, the variable representing the first value, plus x1, plus, of course, x2, plus x3 and the remaining variables. And as you can see, this is sort of cumbersome. And what if I had a hundred or thousand? Let's say these numbers represent record keeping for the temperature or something over a few years. And I wanted to see what is the average temperature over the past 10 years. And that would be 10 years times 365 day about for per year. And so we're talking about thousands of data points and we couldn't possibly use something like an individual variable for each value. And this already comes with just 10. You can imagine twice as many, 20, much less, thousands of them. And so life without an array in that sort of situation is painful to say the least. Here we're gonna try and get an illustration of what an array can give you. And logically, you might wanna think of an array. So we still have our values and the corresponding variables from the world without arrays, because we wanna keep that to compare it with a world with arrays. We still have these values, but we want to treat them as one entity. We want to think of some way, if you can think of it as if you had a container that you could put all the numbers in so that you can deal with it as one entity. A very silly way of thinking about it is if I had some balls on the ground and I need to move them from one room to another room, I can certainly take one ball at a time, but it might be better if I just have a bag or a box, throw all the balls in there, and then just take the box to the next room. And now I'm taking the balls with me. So it's sort of like that, right? We want a, a way to encapsulate and think of the set of numbers as an entity by itself. And if we do that, we can call this an array. 
and we can give a name to our array. So in this case, we're going to call our array nums. Just as a name, we can use anything else. We can start thinking about how do you get to each element or each value in that array. You can see the very first element in that array, we're going to say it's at location 0. And the next one is at location 1, the next one is at location 2, the next is at location 3, and so on have this one name that we can use to represent all our numbers, we can still pick out individual elements out of that collection, right? So an array is a collection. You might hear people say it's a container. All those things are still valid, right? Now you see that it's important for us to be able to say, well, if someone gives me an array, how do I know how many elements or how many values are in that array? And that's where the length comes in. And Go gives you a built-in function called length. You don't have to import any package or anything to use it. And you can just simply say length of whatever the name of that array. It's a function. And it returns the value. And in this case, we have a 10-element array. Another analogy, the way I like to think of it, and I'd like you to consider thinking about arrays, is imagine that you had a mailbox. And this type of mailbox you'd find in like an apartment building or something like that. And you had this mailbox. And each little box or storage unit for a customer or apartment owner would get a number. And so you would just assign a number to each one of these boxes. Think of an array like that is the whole big thing is one way of treating everything. But then you can also talk about the individual storage unit, which are all alike. All of the little boxes store values of the same type. None of the boxes are bigger than any other box and so on. Keep that analogy in mind. Now in mind of Visual Studio Code, and of course, the section three, lecture one, declaring and using arrays. Now, let's revisit how we create a variable. So far, we've learned that if you want to create a variable, you simply use the var keyword and identifier, and then you say the type. So you have something like this. That says that x is an int. You literally read it that way, var x is an int. We also know that how you can create a variable by initializing it with a value and let go derive the type. So we can do that. Okay. So that now says that var y is equal to the value five, and then go is going to infer the type as int. What is an array? An array is a special type of variable that holds multiple values of the same type. This is going to make sense with a very contrived example. So before I get into the example, let's call this the world before arrays. Now, here's a contrived example. Imagine that I have five items and I want to keep track of the prices because I want to do some calculation. I want to get a total. I want to get an average price and so on. Now, you might say, well, five items, I can just look at it and pretty much tell. But we're setting up this example to demonstrate the principle. So how might I do that if I don't know to use arrays? So there are my prices for my five item and I've numbered them from zero. But now I want to do some calculations. So first, let's um, print out all my prices and then Let's do some calculation with it. Well, let's review our program so far. Nothing terribly fancy. I have my five prices. I print them out. Then I do an addition, a summation of the prices into this total variable. I calculate the average price. And that is, of course, the total divided by the number of items that I have. And of course, I print those out. So let's run our program now. And as we expect, those are our values. They're space separated and the total price. I don't like my average price and I do not like my total price either, how it's formatted. They do not look like prices actually. We know to fix that by introducing a type that we can then attach a method to. So let's do that. And notice introducing a type doesn't have anything to do with an array. I just want my printout for my prices to actually look like prices. I have my type, a new type I call float64. I should change all my prices here, which are actually float64 values. I should change those now to currency type. Now we have that prices are currency. And if I rerun my program after that simple change, and now everything looks like price and it's formatted properly. Okay, great. So I'm happy with that. But still, this doesn't tell us anything but arrays, except for this really inconvenience that I have here that I have to call my variable like price zero, price one, price two. And if I were to add another price because I decided that oh, I have a sixth item, now I have to say price five, currency, and whatever value I want to use. Uh, let's just use some value here. And if I want my calculations to come out correctly, I must add that price five to total. 
and now when it comes to the average price i must divide by not five but six now and i still want to print that out too so i have to update a few places and of course things are going to work now because i adjusted my program to take account for the sixth item notice i said sixth item because we're counting from zero okay so how does an array help us? Now this is the world before arrays. So let's see about how do we declare an array. So to declare an array is very simple. We still use var. The array we want to create is called prices. So that still looks the same. And our prices are going to be also currency type. So how do we say this is an array? We use square brackets and a number. And in this case, what I'm saying is prices is an array. When you see the square bracket, if you were keep reading from left to right, var prices, variable prices is an array. When you see the square brackets, an array of six element, each element being of type currency. And that's the thing with an array. It can contain a number of items of or values of the same type. You're not allowed to mix type. And that's because you specify the type here. So every element or each value must be of this type. And we can hold six values of type currency in this one variable. And so this give us the ability to manipulate a number of values using one variable. And let's see how we can do that. Well, first thing first I wanna do is print out this variable and see what it looks like, what is inside of it right now. And notice when I run my program, it shows a square bracket and it shows, oh, this is an array. It has number of values and they are each currency. Notice they have the zero value, which is the default value for anything that's not initialized of an integral value. And we know that currency's base value is, or base type is full. So it will have zero. Okay, so already we can see that oh, there's place for us to put our six prices. And so now all we need to figure out is how to store values in an array. And so let me go back and copy this and paste it below here. And so we don't need to create variables anymore, at least not now. So I'll remove this. And that is it. We have used the array name, which is prices, We've used square bracket again, and this is called indexing. So when you use square bracket with the array name, you're saying you're indexing into the array. Essentially, you want to access the element of that array, and the element we want to access is element zero. Now, this is important. Go is a language that's based off of C, C++, and so on. And like C and C++, it uses zero base indexing. Unlike C and C++, however, you cannot use negative number. So anything less than zero is invalid and your program will panic and crash. Not only that, Go has bounce checking. So which means that since our array is declared as having six elements or six places for storing currency, we can say from zero, one, which zero being the first one, can remember you cannot do negative number and it's zero base. So zero is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. If we try to access the sixth element, we'll get an error. And that is good because it means that oh, you cannot write programs that try to store things in memory location that wasn't allocated. This is a common bug in languages like C or C++. No, we don't have to worry about that because Go flags this as being illegal. Compile time error, okay? So this is not allowed, going out of bounds. Let's try and print out our array after we have initialized it and see how things look. And there we are, exact same thing as before. It looks just like this, except these are individual values that we printed out. Here we print out an array, puts the square bracket in front of it to let us know this is an array, and we still have all the same values. So already we see the convenience of being able to use an array. Now we can just use one variable to store a number of values instead of having to deal with a number of different variables. Now, if that was all there is to it, then we're already ahead being able to use a variable to access and store a number of values. But if you look at this, you can see that these numbers, we can use a variable here also to index into our array. So long as the value of the variable is valid, which means it's more than zero, 
and less than the maximum that you can store in the array. So if our array size is six, then the last index is one less than the length. Well, we can use a variable. So that means now that we can use a for loop. Let's see how we not only iterate, but also access the value for an array. So to access any value from an array, as you can imagine, it looks exactly like how you identify a location to store a value. If I copy and paste what we were doing before, I can write the same code. And now I'm using my array prices. I'm getting the first element of it. Now instead, notice when I put it on the left side and an equal sign, I mean store value into it. But without assigning anything to it, I'm retrieving the value. So I said, get the first value, get the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth, add those up and my result should be the same value as before. And as you can see, it is. What I said earlier is if you look at these values, you can see that they're increasing from zero to five. And we know about four loops, and we know that we can do a for loop that goes from zero to a value five, or the length of the array, one less than the length of the array. Let's write a for loop that would iterate over our array, or visit each element of our array. So what this does is it iterates, it goes from i equals zero, i less than six, i being less than six means it goes from zero to five, which is good. Now we use an i here to index into our prices array. So now that gets us each value, we assign it to price. But we can't just assign it to price, we have to add it to price. So we're gonna do a plus equal increment, which remember is the exact same thing as if we had said this, right? Those two things are the same. But of course, we already have a value in price, so we need to clear price before we use it here. The reason why we didn't have to do that here is because we're doing the summation on the right-hand side and just assigning the total value. But here, we're looping over our array and assigning each value each time around the loop, so we need to start off with price being zero. We can now bring this down, and the result should be the same. And it is. We see that we have the convenience of using a for loop and it's much more compact than using this. Not only that, is if we grow the size of our array, the only thing we need to do is adjust this number here. And even that, there's something for this. Now, what about if we can get the size of the array without having to type it all the time? Here we're remembering it. Yes, we could store it in a constant and reuse the constant, but Go also give us a function that can give us the length of that array. It's called the length function. So let's copy and paste this code. And that's a built-in function. You don't need to import it from anywhere. We're getting this error. And the error here is saying invalid operation. We have length function return an integer, but here we have a currency. We cannot do any calculation, but we know to fix it by casting the integer to a currency value. Now everything is right in the world, and if we rerun our code, this still works. So this is exactly what we expect. We have seen how you can iterate over an array with a for loop using the length function, but it's still even more that Go gives you to make this even easier. Now we're gonna look at iterating over a array using the range function or the range operator actually. And notice I haven't changed much now. I've simply said range over this array and this built-in operator understands how to visit each element of this array and return the index. That's why I haven't changed any of the code. But just let's type in, I usually would use the plus equal operator instead of doing it this way. And again, we get the same result. Of course, now we've seen how oh, much easier it is. We don't even have to use the length function. But even when we had to use the length function, it was still much better than what we were doing before. And still, the fun doesn't end here. We can still do even more with for loop and the range operator. So in this example, what I'm going to do is the range operator could return one value. And in this case, when you do a range over an array, it returns the index of that array but it also can return two values. You can assign not only the index, but also the value. Now you might want to do this because if you want to print out what is the current index and the corresponding value, 
then you might want to get both index and value from the array. So what I'm doing here is I'm printing the prices variable and the index and then, well, string really. And I'm saying prices of this index is equals to a value. So that's why I is going to go here and V is going to go here. So that's the value. And now you can see what that looks like. In the previous lecture, in lecture 13 for section two, we said that one of the things you can do is use the blank identifier and that allow you to ignore a value when you have multiple assignment. For example, in this case, we can rewrite this loop and we can ignore the index because we do not want the index. Remember, if we don't want the value, we simply don't put it in and the range operator works just fine by returning just the index. But if we want the value, then we must specify both and say that we're gonna ignore the index. And since we're ignoring the index, well, we can simply do this. And of course, above here, since we were getting the value already, there's no point in us being explicit because we already have the value V here. So we can just shorten things that way. Not only is it written over the array, easy using the range operator, but also giving you the ability to grow our array wherever we need to initialize it and the rest of this code will work just the same. That works. So one last thing I want to show you before we finish up here in this lecture, and that is how you can initialize an array at the time when you create it. So if we go back here to the initialization of our array. So let's create another array we're going to call prices2. And this is how we did it the first time. And these are our values that we want to initialize the array with. Well, I want to assign the value. So I want to do something similar to something like that. So that is essentially what I wanted. But since this is an array, I must put something on the right side of the equal sign that would allow Go to be able to infer that this is an array of six elements. So the way we do this, if we put equal sign, we still say array six and currency, but now we want to initialize it at the time that we create it. You can remember it's going to be zero otherwise. All I need to do to get my array to be initialized at the time when I create it is enclose the values I want in parentheses and assign it to the array. Of course, I have to proceed that array initialization with the type. So here I say I want a six element array of currency and I initialize it. Now, if I do not include six element, that's fine because this says it's a six element array. And even if I leave out some members, guess what? They're just going to be zero. I can call this, put 60 here, for example, and it will still work fine. But I just wanted to show you that you, it's not illegal for you to say that you have a larger array and only initialize it with a few values. And there you go. Let's look at your exercise. So your exercise today is very simple. You're going to create a program which declares 10 to 20 elements. The second thing you'll do is initialize your array with some random values. So where are you going to get the random values? Well, you're going to get it from this input package that get random float. Once you initialize your array, you're going to do some calculation. You're going to calculate the total, max, min, and average for those numbers in your array and print it out, of course. And if you get stuck, just check the solution. Welcome to lecture two in section three. And today we're going to be looking at arrays and function. Specifically, how can we use arrays with function? That is to pass arrays to function as parameters so that we can call a function with an array parameter and how to return arrays from function. And while we're doing this, we're going to stumble upon something and that's going to allow us to talk about pass by value. So the best way to get a feel for this is to do some code. So let's jump in. As usual, I'm starting with a relative empty Golang program. And so let's close this side so we can get some space. And the first thing I want to do is now that we know about how to declare and use array, let's create an array with some data. And I'm going to use the input package I introduced in section two, lecture 12. Okay, so I've written up um, some code here. I have a variable called data. It's an array of 10 integers. Use a for loop to initialize my array, get in some value between minus 10 and this time 20. 
So let's run this and see if it works. And that's good. So if we keep running this, we'll see that we'll get different sets of values between minus 10 and 20. That's what we, we're asking for. So let's say we wanted to find a minimum value. So we're going to write a function called min, and we're going to pass it this array and look, we'll have it return the minimum value. So that's pretty straightforward. Of course, at this point, we don't have the min function yet, so we still need to write that. So here's my minimum from min function, and I know that all the length of this array is 10, is exactly 10 because nothing else is allowed to be passed in since I've said that D is of type 10 element array all in hints. So I assign to M the very first element value and assume essentially that the first element value is my smallest or the minimum value. So now I just simply need to compare that to the rest of the array, which is why I start from one to I less than the length of the array, and I make that comparison and I test it. So if any other value D of I is less than the M that I assume is the minimum value, then of course I overwrite it and keep testing. At the end of the for loop, M will have the minimum value in the entire array and we simply return it. So let's run our code and see if this works. And as we can see, it looks like it's working. We have minus four, and here the minimum value in this array is minus four. So one of the reasons I'm using such a small number array is because it's easy for us to just eyeball it, so to speak, and see that it's correct. And here we can see it's minus nine, and here it's minus 10. What we did was pass an array to a function, and it was just like using any other data type in, in Go, so there's nothing special. And for that reason, we can introduce or make this a type. And one reason you might want to do that is let's imagine that I wanted to change the size of my data set. And now I'm getting this error here because it's saying, oh, your data set and uh, expected type for the min function are different. They're two different types. In order to make things easier to code, what you should probably do is introduce a new type to represent this. So let's call that data set. Since I'm, I've created a new type to represent an array, maybe I might, well, might also want to use a constant to represent the length of the array. My code should work the exact same way as before. Easy for me to just, if I want to use a different size here, I change it one place and I'm using an array of 20 element now. And if I want to add, change it again, it's just changing it in one place. Code works exactly the same. So let's make it 10 again. So that's easier to work with in terms of looking to see if things are correct. So now I have a minimum value function. And we can see, like I said, it's worked like any other data type. Let's write a function that sorts our data. We want it to be sorted on the, if you imagine an array as going from left to right, we want the least, smallest value on the left and the largest value in the array on the right. So let's sort it. So let's write a sort function. So we might think, well, one way to sort it is to just have a function called sort, and we pass it the data that we want it to sort, and maybe it will move the data, the elements around in that array, and then all we have to do is print it out something like that. So if we write the sort function, pass it the data, and we assume that somehow it's getting, it's having access to this data, if in, within the sort function, we can move the data around, then after we call sort, we should have a sorted array. So let's write that sort function. Now, how are we going to sort the data? We're going to use something called bubble sort. So what is bubble sort? Well, let me just try and illustrate for you how bubble sort work, and then we'll come back and implement it. So sorting illustrated. Really, this should be bubble sorted illustrated. So first thing, let's assume that we have some numbers and we want to sort it. Remember, our objective is to have this number go from zero through 10, because we want zero to be on the left-hand side, the smallest number, which is zero in this case, to be on the left-hand side, and the largest number 10 to be on the far right. So how might we go ahead to go about doing this? Well. First thing we want to do is have index, because this is an array. And 
the first thing we're going to do is assume that we can compare any two numbers and see which one is the smallest. Since we want the smallest to be on the left hand side, if we compare two numbers and the one on the right um, is smaller, we're going to swap it. So in this example, we're going to use a variable i to point to the number on the left, variable j to point to the number on the right, and then we do a comparison. In this case, if we compare offset 0 with offset 1, we can see it of 3 is less than 4, so we swap them. Once we swap them, now we have something that looks like this. We have 3 on, on the left-hand side, 4 is now on the right, but we still point into the two same location. What we have just done is we've partitioned our array. We have this part of the array that is sort of on search. We don't know what else is in the rest of that array that might be less than three. But we know so far that on the right hand side, that is the smallest value we have so far. And as you can see on the left hand, on the right hand side, um, there is a zero all the way to the far right. So that entire space is really unknown to us right now. And so we can repeat this by moving j over by one. And we keep i the same thing because we know that i there is the smallest value we have seen so far. So we move j over in this unsearch space. And now we do a comparison and of course swap those values too if it's thing. And we keep repeating this over and over. We keep moving j down in this unsorted space. And every time we find a value on the right, that is smaller than the value that we are pointing to at i in location 0, we just simply swap it. And so after we swap, we will have something that looks like this. And we keep moving j down and we repeat. We move j to offset 9. That is when we will need to do swap. And again, when we do this comparison, we'll say, OK, is j less than the value that we point to at i? And it is. And so we swap those two. We have scanned the entire array and we have the absolute smallest value or lowest value or minimum value in that array, we have it on the left-hand side. Now, if we repeat this, and now since we know that we have moved the smallest value in the array to the, to the left, we can increment i by 1. So now we've moved i over to 1. And j, notice, it is always it always starts at one value ahead of i. That's because since i is already pointed to a value, j should point to the very next value. And so we can do the same thing again. We can compare these two. And in this case, j, of course, is less. So we're going to swap them. And then if we move j over, and again, now j is less than i, we're going to swap it again. And so we're reducing our source space. And we can keep doing this over and over. And when we our j is pointing to 9, we'll see that the number at 9 is less than the number we're pointing at at offset 1, so we swap it. And so this might not look like we're making much progress because now we've put 2 all the way to the end of our array. But notice what's happening on the left-hand side. After scanning this array, this array twice, now we've completed two scans of the array, and each time we go around this loop, it's the, the unsorted space is getting smaller and smaller, right? Notice now we have two values at the far right that represent the smallest values and then they're in the correct sorted order. So we can repeat this by, of course, making i point to 2. And you see the pattern by now. Now we can go back to the code and implement what we have just done. And so our sort function is literally for i starting at the very first index. And remember, we're going to keep i pointing at a value, then use a second index j that iterate over a subspace, which is i plus 1 and compare it to i. So let me write that. So let's look at the code now, our sort function. It's exactly what we were showing on the slide. I start i going over the range of d. Now that is going to be 0 to 1 less than the length of d. So i is going to be taken care of. We don't have to worry about that. j, on the other hand, as we said, it always starts with 1 greater than i. So in this case, we don't need to do the entire range of d. We can just say j is equals to i plus 1 every time you go into that subloop. And of course, now we want to say j is less, never gets beyond the end of the array. So hence, we use the less than the length function. In terms of our test, it's straightforward. 
if d of j, which is the current j we're pointing to, is less than the d of i that we assume to be the smallest, then we should swap those values. And all I'm doing is using the fact that go allows me to do multiple assignments. So this is our swap function. All we need to do now is run it and see if it works. So what happened? Oh, look at this. It didn't look like this did anything whatsoever. If we're moving values around and swapping them, why is our result still exactly the same as the original data set? So to see if this is working, what we should probably do is print out the value inside our swap function just before, after the for loop, just before it returns. So let's print this out here. And so we want to say sort it inside a function or something to that extent. Okay, so that works. So this is inside our sort function. Let's rerun the code. Ah, look at that. So this is our result from inside our sort function. And look at it. It looks like it's working. We have minus 10, minus 8, minus 7, minus 7, and minus 2, and so on. Let's run it again. And yes, that sort function is working. So what this tells us is that when you pass a, an array to a function, a copy of the array is passed to the function. And that explains why when we pass our data to sort, a copy of that array was passed to sort. Sort was able to manipulate that array, hence why D has the changes. But once we return, data wasn't passed to the array itself, so just a copy of data, so data remained the same. This is important because what if, like I showed before, it's very easy for you to create a large data set. So now let's say you're reading from a file, you have 10,000 items or 100,000 or 200,000 items in an array, and you pass it to a sort function, you have to pass a copy. Go has to duplicate that data. Depending on how much data we're talking about, for 20,000, it's not a problem. I could run this now and it's run relatively quickly. That's not a problem. I could even make it 100,000 and it still would run fairly quickly, okay? But once you start talking about a whole lot more data than that, so it's still going through the sort, but there it is, the result. It still took a few seconds, but you know, for this 100,000 integers. But as you start using larger and larger amount of data, you can find your program running very slow, or it might even crash if it cannot duplicate the data. Right? Just remember that you're duplicating the data. And in this simple example, we have only have one piece of data. But remember, if you're writing big and large application, you just won't have one data set alone of maybe 100,000 value, but you have several. Okay, And you're passing it around different parts of your applications for, for doing different things and so on. Keep that in mind that when you pass an array in a, to a Go function, you're passing a copy of that array. So if we want our sort function to work correctly, for now, we're still going to pass a copy of it but we sorely need to return the result. So let's return D. After we manipulate D, we want to return it. This can be our sorted data. Notice that in terms of returning an array, I just list it like any other data type and that's it. I just return it. There's nothing special. So now let's rerun our program. And hooray, everything is working fine. Depending on the application we're writing, we could take advantage of the fact that we know that our data is either sorted or unsorted. In this case, when we were looking for minimum, we had a data set that wasn't sorted, so we had to iterate through the entire set. But one of the things we can do is we can rewrite our min function to use a sorted data set. And in that case, we, we don't have to loop over the data more than once. Like depending on how much data you manipulate in, you might want to take advantage of how and when you decide to do things like sort or so on, because if you know that oh, you have to sort the data, best to sort it before you do things like look for min, because you're gonna if you're talking about a million element array, you're gonna have to sort one million elements before you find the smallest one. But then when you have to run the sort function, you have to go through that array yet again so you might make you you will make your program more efficient and faster if you sort the data first and then do things like finding min and max the minimum value in a sorted array is simply the first one which is offset zero and the maximum value if we wanted a max function 
is literally the last one, which is length minus one. Even when I do a return of D, I'm returning a copy of D. There's no way for me to prove it because once my function return, I no longer have access to D, so I can't show you that oh, D is still available. But just keep that in mind that passing it to a passing array to a function makes a copy, returning from a function makes a copy. So in this case, our sort programmer is sort of inefficient because we have to copy the area data to pass it in, that's one copy. Then we manipulate the area D, and when we return, a copy is also made again to return it. Just keep those things in mind. So one of the things we might want to do, of course, since we know that we can easily return an array from a function, is probably put our data initialization into a function. But I'll leave that as an exercise for you to do. Let's take a look at your exercise for this lecture. First thing you're going to do is in this exercise, you have two to-dos. To-do one is to calculate some stats on temperature values. And the way you're going to get your temperature values is essentially how I got some values to play with. You're going to call that input get random int number in function and get values between minus 20 and 120. And let's assume those are the temperature range that you care about. Here are some of the things I want you to do with that data. I want you to sort the data, get the max value, the min value, and of course the average temperature. The only other requirement is that your temperature code should be in its own package and call temp. And you'll see that if you look at my main that go, which I give you already, there's a temp that print. So essentially you're going to write a temp package and notice how I import relative to the directory I'm in. So you're going to have a directory here that has your code and you're going to export a function called print which is going to print out all the things you have computed for to do one. In to do two, we'll put this in its own the solution for to do two in its own package called cart. And in this package, I've already created some code for you. I have a currency that go file, and I have a total that go file which implements this function called get total. Get total simply returns a value that's a currency. And so here's a test of get total. And it's very easy to use. It's just simply called get total and it returns a value. So if I run this, you'll see that it prints out. Uh, where is it? All right, let's go to the solution directory. I stop to say zero two cart go test okay there we go all right so for some reason from my editor it wasn't running so i don't know why but if you run that now you see that oh, it's just returned some currency value so that's fine so that's all that it really does and what i want you to be able to do with that currency value is uh, this is preview but two things so you initialize an array representing uh, total purchases of 20 shoppers. So each shopper has a shopping cart, and that's the total. When you call get total, it returns you the total for these shopping carts. For each shopper, you're going to calculate a 5% discount and an 8% sales tax. And then, of course, you're going to print the result. Print the results in some meaningful way. I'll show you my example. So, first of all, let's go back up and I'll go to solution. Exercise zero 02. And let's do go run. And as you can see, let's scroll up. The first thing is this is my data set. This is the sorted data. And of course, my maximum value, minimum value, the sum, and the average temperature. Then for to do two, I decided to print it out in this table to show each shopper ID. Remember, I have 20 shoppers, shopper ID 1, shopper 1. This is the initial total that I got. This is what happened after I apply a 5% discount. And then this is the final total price they will pay with an 8% sales tax. So you can print this out however you want, just so long as it's meaningful and informative. Now, in terms of how I print this out and the spacing and so on, I put a reference to the code in the solution that this is from the Golang FF 
FMT package and all you need to do is go to Golang FMT package and read up on printing and it's going to tell you how to use those width specifiers. So this is the section you want to, you would like, you should read and it explains exactly how you can specify width values. Okay. So that's your exercise. Welcome to lecture three in section three, declaring and using slices. Our objective for this lecture is to understand what is a slice, how to declare a slice, how to store and retrieve values from a slice, how to calculate the length of a slice, and finally, how to iterate over the values that you might store in a slice. Now, since we just covered arrays, you're thinking, this looks very much like arrays. We've just substituted the word array for slice, but there's something very different about slices when it comes to array, and that's how they're declared. Before we get into that, let's see if we can get an intuitive feel for what slices are by looking at some pictures and illustration before we look at the code. So this is my definition of what a slice is. A slice is a subset or a window into an array. What do I mean by that? Let's imagine we have an array, and of course I'm showing the offset there too, and I give my array the name nums. If I'm interested in the first four elements of this array, which would be the numbers 12, 53, 86, and 94. So we see those run from offset zero or index zero to index three. So I can think of having a window over this array so that I can only look at the set of or the range of elements I'm interested in. Notice this window just allows me to see the set of elements I'm interested in in the underlying array. Of course, I can move my window around and I can change it to look at something else. So I can create another window for the same array that just showed me something else, a different set of elements in the same array. I haven't changed my array. I just created another window to show me a different set of value. And you can imagine my window can be of any size. I can look at the entire array or I can look at a much smaller subsect of that array. So if we think of what this window really means is that we always have an array to which the slice refers. So when we create a slice or this window, I want you to think of it when I say slice, think of it as like a window into an underlying array. We always have to have an associated array where we're gonna be looking at. And of course, we also have the offset, which is where we start from in that underlying array. And then we have the length, which how many elements are we interested in in that underlying array? So if we look at another example of another slice, we can see that we're referring to the same array this time our offset has changed. We are saying, oh, I'm interested in starting at offset one in that underlying array. And the number of elements I'm interested in are six elements. And so that's the length of our slice. So that's why when I mentioned in the objectives that we can determine the length of a slice, this is why, because our slice can have a different length than the underlying array it came from. When we look at the example of just looking at two elements, well, the length is two or offset is different. And so you can keep the length the same and just change the offset and you'll see that how you're having a different view of your underlying array. Of course, each one of those would be a different slice. So a slice is one window and you could create multiple of these slices or multiple window to the same array. And we're going to see this in code. I want to show you first, give you an idea illustration so you have a picture to work with when we start looking at the code. And in the example where we slice the entire array, our window is just big enough to look at the entire underlying array and our offset is starts from zero and the length is all the elements in that underlying array. So let's jump to the code now and play around with this a little bit, create some slices, see how we can get the lengths of them, iterate over it and all that stuff that we set out in the objective. Let's get all of that accomplished and show how we do it in code. I'm starting with a simple Go application that doesn't do anything. And to give us some more room to type, I will close the navigation bar. If we do a quick review, we know that in Go, you declare a variable by typing the var keyword, the name of the variable, and the type. For example, an error variable would look like this. So we have declared a variable and we have printed out not only the contents of that array variable, but also the type. If you remember, percent capital T allows us to ask Go to tell us the type that variable and it's pretty straightforward. Another thing we can do is we can create arrays or variables of any type. It doesn't have to be a built-in type like in. We could, for example, define our own type currency and also create arrays of values. Of course, if we run this, we expect it to work. And as we can see, we have our array A and our cart with floating point value, which happens to be zero and they're printed out and we have the type, which is main currency. So no surprise there. 
So how do we declare then a slice? And notice, declaring a slice looks very much like you declare an array, except you do not specify a length. Let's print out what our array value looks like and the type of it. Of course, we know that the type is just going to be square bracket int, but let's just print it out anyway. And we go run our program. And so, of course, since we didn't put a length value in this size declaration, square bracket with int. So we can see a slice is simply square bracket followed by a type. And of course, this forms a new type itself, but I'm talking here about the type of each element of that slice, just like we would have here the type of each element of the array. So this is our slice and it's empty. There's nothing in there. So how do you populate a slice then? One of the things that we can do with an array is create a slice from an array. And the way to understand this is to say, if I have an array and I wanted to only see a part of it, that would be a slice. Now, a part could also be the whole thing. So let's say I had the following array. And so I've just created an array called nums. I'm going to print out that array that shows the numbers. And we can do the same thing here for a slice. We can print out the length of our slice. runner code and we can see that the slice zero has length zero. Of course, we still have the same type and of course, our array nums has length n. But like I said before, if you imagine that we have an array like we do here, and I just wanted a peek into some of the values, maybe instead of pulling out one value, I say I wanted to see a range of values from that array. What I'm asking for is a slice. So I can choose any part of this array that I want to window or I want a peek of. And since a slice is a window into the array, then you could create multiple slices into the same array. So let me just show you that for that to make sense. I'm going to start off by creating a slice of that array. And that is the simplest and easiest slice I can create. When we use this colon operator in the index, what we're saying is I want a slice of the entire array starting from the very first element to the last element. And let's take a look at that. And I'm going to, of course, do the same thing here. Because what we want to see is not only the elements that we get from this slice, but the length of it and, of course, the type. And look at that. When I slice the array, I get all the elements. Because, like I said, the colon operator says, give me a window or a subset of the array that just happens to be the entire array. But notice the length is the same, but the type has changed. It's changed from array of 10 element to just slice of int. That's it. Even though it has a length, that length is not reflected in the type. So to make our life easier, let's store this value, whatever this value is. I'm saying it's a slice. Let's store it because it looks exactly like this. The type of when I slice that array, the type I got back, square bracket int, is the exact same thing as this. So we can either store this result into S0, but I'll create a new variable for now. So I can change this to S1 instead. So I can use this new variable that I created. Now let's rerun that and see. And there we go. So S1 has the exact same type as S0, even though look at the length of S0. The length of S0 is 0. The length of S1 is 10, but you're not seeing the size of it being reflected because a slice is a projection. It's a special type of value that has as its underlying storage or it points to an underlying array. To make this clear, let's look at how we can create even more slices from the same array. What I've done now is created a slice S2 from the same nums array. And instead of specifying the lowest limit where it starts, I only specify the upper bounds of that slice. So let's print that out and see what we get. If we look here, we can see that slice two is the first five elements of that array. And the length of it is also five. Notice the type doesn't change. The type remains the same, even though they have different lengths and contain different values. We're gonna see about how you use the slice in a minute which offsets are valid. But right now, look at the values that's being stored in the slice. 
the first five elements. And if you look at how I created the slice, you see that I simply said, start from the beginning. So when I leave this out, this is a shorthand for go saying, oh, this is the same as if I had specified zero. This is the exact same thing as that. Here, we're gonna figure out what this is just now. So I don't wanna type that just yet. So let's create yet another slice, S3. Instead, I'll put the five as our starting offset, and I wouldn't specify an ending offset. And we'll see what we get. Of course, you should be suspicious by now and have some idea of what we should expect to get. And slice three is the last five elements of our array. So what is going on? When I say I want to start from five, this is the offset. So here, when I say I want to start from zero, uh, let's type that in. So here, I say I want to start from zero, so that's clear. This includes offset zero, offset one, offset two, offset three, offset four. Yet, I'm specifying five. Now we can get the length from this upper bound minus this lower bound. So five minus zero is five. So that gives me my length and that is correct. But notice offset five is here. I do not want to use offset five when I specify it here. So the last number here is actually one past the end or one past the offset we actually want to use. So it's one more than. So this is really zero through offset four that I really want in my array, but I specify five to say one past it. And the reason why is because when it comes to calculating the length of it, now if you had done four minus zero, that would have been incorrect. So taking away the upper bound minus the lower bound give you the correct answer regardless. And you'll see that in a minute. So here, for example, what we're really doing is zero through the length of the array. So this is zero through 10, and this is five through 10. So that's really what is happening here. When we do this, it's as if we're saying length of num. The exact same thing. So it's a short hand. For instead of typing all of this, you can leave off when you need to start from zero, just leave it off. If you want to the end, just leave off that also. And that means to the end. So that's a shortcut. So let's try one more slice. And three colon seven is exactly what it is. So there's no shortcut for that. But if we can figure out what the length of this slice is going to be, seven minus three is four. So we expect the length to be four. And in terms of the valid index, as we saw, this represents the first offset where we're going to start in our array. So since this is three, we expect to be starting from offset three. So zero, one, two, three. So we should expect nine to four as the first value in slice four. And since we said it's going to be four, we expect to be 94, 75, 10, and two. And we know from the fact that this is a 10 element array, this is offset nine, eight, seven. But notice I said it's going to end at two. So that's offset six. But we've seen this already. This last number represents one past the offsets which we want. So we want offset six to be included. So it's really at offset seven that we have to specify. So let's run this and see. And the length is four. And like we said, nine is four, seven to five, 10, and two. Those are the values from offset three, four, five, and six. And we want it to end at seven. So it was one past the place we want to end, which was six. But again, notice the type of it. They're all the same. So this means we can take any one of these slices and store it in the other variable, and it wouldn't matter. So, so far, we've seen how to declare and slice. It looks very much like an array, except you leave out the number. We see how you can slice an existing array to create slice values and store them into a slice variable, but we haven't seen how we can access individual elements of a slice. But like I said, a slice is just like an array, so we can do the same set of operation we normally do with an array. So what are we doing? We're saying for i and range over s1. This looks just like when we say range over an array. Well, it doesn't matter, still works the same. So range over s1, and when we range it over S1, you're going to have the index i, and we're going to go into that S1 and print out the value. So we also want to see what i is. Remember, our S1 slice was the entire array. Let's see what we get. And of course, we've printed it out already. And we're going to use i to assign to that slice. And we want to see the end result. So what we really should print out, actually, 
is the nums array to see if that is being changed. And as you can see, even though we're using slice one, we have an index, the length is 10. So of course we're gonna have values zero through nine. And these are the values that we printed out before. So it makes sense that we can access those value with the index. And then within the for loop, we also updated the slice. We use S1 of I to update it. But if we look, we'll see that the array itself was changed. So that's why I said a slice is a window into an array. A slice doesn't have its own storage, it always uses an array. So when we create our very first slice, we declare a slice variable. This slice had no underlying array associated with it. So if you try to store a value in this slice, it will fail and your program will panic and exit. This slice one is the full length of the array, so probably no surprise there. Let's see what happened when we try to use some of the other slices. Once again, we're doing something very simple. We're using slice two, iterate over it, print out its value, and then change the value. This time, however, for slice two, I want to set the value to minus one instead of i. And let's print that out. And notice what happened. Slice two length was five. And of course, since slice two represented the first five elements of that nums array, well, those are the elements that we get to affect. So we can affect the first five elements of that underlying array because that is what the slice represented. By now, hopefully you're seeing the pattern, but let's continue. And it shouldn't be any surprise that now since slice three, let's go back to slice three, slice three represent the upper five elements of our array that using this range, I will only have access to those upper five elements of the nums array. So this allowed me to set those numbers to one. And that's exactly what we see. Finally, I will use slice four and set of elements in the array to zero. And if we remember, those were four elements sort of in the middle of the array. And that is exactly what we get. You get the middle four elements zero and the end result after manipulating the underlining array through is different slices. I have no change how that array looks. Now, you might be thinking, why would we use something like a slice which have all the usage semantics of an array. Well, for one thing, if you remember when we were looking at the type or slice, they all have the same type, regardless of how many elements they store. So if you imagine passing this to a function or just having a variable, you can point to any number of elements, even though the type remains the same because the type itself just says slice of int or slice of strings or whatever and inside of that is hidden the details about how long that slice is and where the array containing that information is actually stored if you would like to learn more please read the go language specification on slice type and slice expression and then there's a great blog post from the go lang folks called go slices usage and internals that's it for this lecture take care see you in the next video so in terms of your exercise for this week if we bring back up our navigation bar and we look at the stub or description. If you look at your exercise for this week, it looks very similar and it's actually taken from exercise one, which is to declare an array of 10 to 20 elements of type float and use a constant to declare that array size. So that remains the same. The only thing you're going to do differently now, create a slice or initialize a slice from that array. For this exercise, once you initialize the slice, that is the only purpose of using the array in this exercise. You will not use that array name again. From that point forward, you use the slice to store some random number and also to calculate some total max and so on. If someone doesn't show you whether a variable was declared as a slice or an array, you would not be able to tell from this usage which one it is. This exercise should be literally copy and paste and modifying about two or three lines. So if you have problems, of course, you can take a look at my solution. Welcome to lecture four in section three, slices and functions. Our objective in this lecture is to understand how slices and functions work together. We'll be looking at passing slices to functions as parameter and how to return slices from functions. Additionally, we'll compare arrays and slices in the context of function to see what are the differences? Which one may be better to use? Finally, we will revisit variadic functions. We cover variadic functions in section two, lecture nine. So where do we start? 
I don't have any code yet, but that's because I want to reuse some code we've already written. So I'll use the code that we wrote in lecture two, section three. And that is because it's going to be very similar to the code that I want to develop in lecture four anyway. So we might as well start off with code that we've already written. I'll close this and of course, give us some more room and update a few things. And instead of doing arrays, we're doing slices. As you can see, arrays and functions, slices and function, very similar name. Of course, that's what I want to use it. Okay. So we know how to declare a slice already. In this piece of code, I have a type called data set, which is defined to be an array of a certain size for, of ints. I'll still keep my cons data set size, but I want my data set type to just be the type defining a slice. So we know that, oh, the way you declare a slice is by simply square bracket and the type it's going to store. So that's our slice. So we know data set is just a slice. What this means is data is a slice and it's a nil slice. Note that once we create a slice variable, we do not have an underlying array. So the slice cannot store any data and it's nil. It doesn't point to an array. So it is invalid to try and store data into that slice. And we can try storing some data and we'll see that it will crash, right? If we now try to run the code. Okay. And you can see index out of bound. That is because we do not have a valid slice. It's nil. But I do need a slice on which I can work because my for loop here tries to store some data into this slice. So let's do what we've done before and create an array, which we'll initialize our slice with. So, okay. So now our data slice is just properly initialized with an underlying array and now this piece of code should work. So let's run it and see. And notice how everything works the same simply by changing our type from an array to a slice. We did not have to change anything else. And we saw this before in the previous lecture, when we look at slices, we saw that those slices behave exactly like arrays, except that you have this ability to have multiple slices into an array. So we shouldn't be surprised that just changing our data type to a slice that everything else should work. It just looks like an array to all the code that we have already written. So what is the benefit then? Like this is really surprising. We didn't have a lot to do. So first of all, let's compare this code with the previous code. So I'll right click this and say select to compare. I'll go here and then compare with selective. And if I close this off and scroll down, as you can see, nothing else changed. The only thing we did was create an array, sliced it and store it into data. And of course, change the type of our data set. That's it. Two changes is all we did. And our code still worked the same. So let me close this and go back to the code. So, okay, so this is easy, but what now? Now we know how to pass slices to functions and return slices from functions. Well, we're doing exactly that here. But the question is, do we really need to return a slice? Because so far, it looked exactly the same. When we did not return a slice from our sort function, we did not modify the underlying array because we were passing a copy of the array. So let's remove the return value here. And we we're going to say that we don't need to return a slice and see if this works. And since we don't have s data as a value that's returned from sort, we can rerun our code. And notice how our code still works, even though we do not return a slice. So this is telling us something. When we pass data, to our sort function, a copy of that slice is made, but that's just yet another slice pointing to the same array. Because why? The slice itself has some metadata. It says, which array am I using? Where's the start and offset? And how long it is? The interesting thing here, or the important thing rather, is that now since we make a copy of that information, that information still has the same metadata, which is I'm pointing to this array. This is my length. This is my start. So since it's pointing to the same array, it didn't copy the array, but rather just copy that metadata. And so within our search function, we have access to that array. And so that's why we manipulate that same array that the slice was pointed to was passed to a sort, and we don't have to actually return it. This has important consequence for manipulating a large set of data. Sure, it's more efficient, but remember, since you're using slices, you're manipulating the underlying array. 
So if there's a need in your program to keep a copy of that original data on Modify, then you'd want to copy it first. And that's what we're going to cover in the next lecture. But for now, at least we see that the big advantage of using slices is that when you pass a slice parameter to a function or you return a slice parameter from a function, you don't have to do or incur the cost of copying or duplicating the data. And this is significant when you're using large data sizes. The other advantage of using a slice is if you remember when we were using arrays, our type encodes how long that array should be. In this example, I am passing half of the array, or it doesn't really matter if it's half or not, but just a fraction of that array, I have sliced it and stored it in data, store some value in it, and now passing it to the same min and sort function. So now we can rerun the code and it works just fine with either the full array or half as much. And you can imagine that it would work just as well with a much larger data set. And so now I've created a slice of a very large array. I'll spend some time initializing it, but notice again, I don't have to worry about rewriting another min or mat or sort function for this different size data. It will still work whether it's less or more. Now I don't want to print it out because it's quite a bit of data and I do not want to print out the sorted data either, but instead let's print the min and maybe a fraction of the sorted data. And there we go. And of course, we can change our range to be a little bit more interesting. So as you can see, this seems to work just fine. It takes some time. That's because we're basically talking about 100,000 integers that we have to sort. But at least we know when we pass those 100,000 integers to our sort function, they're not being copied. And our function can return without having to make yet another copy. So far, we've seen that passing slices to function better than and more efficient memory wise and would be faster to pass a large array as a slice to a function to be worked on. You save on memory, you save on time spent doing the copying. Returning a large set of data from a function, best to do it with a slice. So we've seen those two things. And so when we compare slices to array, we can see that using a slice is much better than using an array. And unless you have really, really good reason to use array, always prefer to use slices. Even if you're given an array, just slice it and write your algorithms and function to work on slices because then it can be amended very easily and be reused without any change in code, whatever, to that algorithm if you have a larger data set. So always try to prefer slices. I said one of the other things that we're going to look back at in this lecture was variadic functions. Let's write a function which is going to do addition, basically sum. Essentially what I've written is just a simple function called sum and it takes zero or more in value. So these are some of the ways we can call sum. So of course we can call sum without any parameter whatsoever and we should expect it to return zero. We could call it with one parameter. And since there's nothing else to sum it with, it should return that. And we could call it with a few more parameters. If we run this now, because we haven't written anything really, we should get zero for all our values. Uh, you know what? I'll remove the sort call here because it's going to take a little time every time we run our code. And I don't want to deal with that hit. And I don't want to see. 20, well, I guess I could see 20 zero value. That shouldn't take any time to print out, but let's do this again. And we can see it there. So our output, again, just zero. Well, before we can understand how we should really access the values for V, let's print out what type V is. So let's rerun our code now. And look at that. So V is a slice of int. Even though we declare it as a variadic parameter, the parameter to sum is not a slice. I know this because if I try to call sum with a slice, it will complain. So we already have a slice data. If we try to just pass a few of those values to our sum, it will not work. It will complain. Just five, it doesn't matter. Five or 10, it doesn't matter. As you'll see that we cannot use data slice 10 as a value to our argument to sum because they're two different things. 
So we cannot pass this slice to sum. We'll revisit this line, but for now I'll comment it. But inside the function, this is how Go is allowing us to access those many values that we get. So since this is a slice, we know that we can just iterate over it. So now we can properly implement our sum. So since we do not want the index, we can ignore that. And that is all it calls for us to implement our sum. By now you understand how for loop, range, and slices work, that you should be convinced that how this code will work. And so I'll remove this, because we don't need that. And let's rerun our code. And there you go. That is the value we should expect, 0, 5. And if we go through and look at summing up those values, it comes out to nine. So this seems to work. The question is, can we still use a slice of value or even an array and pass it to a function that expects variadic parameters? In other words, can we expand those individual array values so that they look as if we are calling the function with the individual values? So one way you might imagine calling sum is to say this and so on. And for our example above, essentially we want to keep going until we get data of nine. So is there a shorthand for this instead of doing this? And the answer is yes. I call it the expand operator. And essentially what you do is if you want to pass slice to a function that expect variadic parameter is you put an ellipsis after the value. And it basically says expand those into individual values. So again, you can imagine that Go, behind the scenes, is just doing some gymnastics for us, a little bit of a shortcut. And notice now I don't have any warning or errors, and I can rerun my code. Having variadic parameters and now knowing slices and array, we can not only consume them within our function, because the variadic parameter is going to be given to us as a slice, but now if we have slices and array and we want to pass them to a function that expects variadic parameters, we can also use it. So let's try this example again, this time with an array. And so we haven't seen this way of declaring an array, but essentially, based on the number of elements I specify in my initializer, you use that as the length of the array. So this is the exact same thing as if I said, I want a four element array of int. And if I have another value, this is the exact same thing as if I put five in this place. Let's pass that array to our sum function. And as you can see, it fails. And that is because we cannot take an array and expand it. We can only take a slice and expand it. So this works like that. So we can take an array, but we have to slice it first. Hopefully this makes sense. Uh, definitely play with it if you don't get it yet, or it seems confusing. Play with it a little bit, write some more examples, play around with the code, and make sure that you understand what is happening. If you want to confirm that this is indeed an array and not a slice, of course, that's very easy to do. And we can see it says array of five integers. So that is an array. Okay, that's it. Take care. See you in the next lecture. Bye. Let's take a look at your exercise. And so your exercise for four is essentially the same thing as what you did for arrays. The only difference is now you create an array of a few thousand elements. So remember that though we're talking about temperature ranges from minus 20 to 120. So just imagine that you have maybe 10 years of data or something like that that you've collected daily. And so we have a few thousand ints that we want to find the minimum temperature, the maximum temperature, and so on. And so you'll use that array of a few thousand ints and initialize a slice from it. But you will not use the array once you created the slice. Once you have the slice, now you use the slice to initialize that underlying array. It's very, very simple. Hopefully, when we did our example where we only changed the type, you saw that we didn't have to change any of the code. And that's only to really drive home the point that arrays and slices pretty much work the same way. There's some other things that you can do to your code now that you know that how you're using a slice. And that is when it comes to sorting the value, you know that you do not need to return a slice. Hi, welcome to lecture five in section three. And in this lecture, we'll be looking at how to create slices at runtime, how to expand them, grow them, in other words, 
how to copy them. And we'll see when we say copy, we mean something slightly different than just assigning and how to shrink slices. Before we look at the code though, I want us to have an idea of what we'll be looking at in detail. So like I said, we're looking at creating slices at runtime. So far, the way we have created slices is from an existing array. I will see why this is sort of limited because it means that you always have to have an array first before you can work with slices. Look at expanding and growing slices, how to copy them, and finally, how to shrink slices. Before we get into the code, however, let's have an idea of what we mean when we say creating slices at runtime. So let's say we declare a variable s as a slice. We know that in order for it to be useful, it needs an underlying array. For the moment, I'm ignoring and not showing all the offsets and all this other stuff because you know that already, so keep that in mind. So the question is, can we get an anonymous array to which our slice s points to without us first having to create that array? That's why it's anonymous because we don't know where the array is. We don't know the name of it. All we know is there's an array that we want for our slice because we want a usable slice and we know it must have an array. In terms of copying, there are two ideas to keep in mind. If we have a slice s, let's say for now we initialize it from an array and we say we're going to point this slice to some array. Again, leaving the details of where it's pointed to and how big it is and so on. Now, if we do a s2 is equals to s1, we know that what we're really saying is that s2 points to the exact same array and of course to the same window and the same number of elements and all this other stuff because s2 and s1 are equal but they point to the exact same array. And this is what allows us to use slices as parameters to function and return them from function, knowing very well that the array itself will not be copied, but rather only the metadata that points to this array. And we exploit that benefit to say that oh, we can pass really large arrays to a function to be operated on by simply passing a slice to that array. However, when we talk about deep copying a slice, we can imagine that we have a slice S1 and if we say we want a deep copy, what we want is that slice one, while it points to its own array, when we make a deep copy to slice two, slice two should point to its own array. So we should make a copy of the arrays. So we do not want the default behavior of slices where they reuse the array. We actually want the array to be copied. Keep in mind this idea of a shallow copy versus a deep copy. So now that we've covered at least in theory, some of the things we want, let's jump into code and take a look. So what I have here is a, a simple Go language program. And this is our lecture five in section three. I'll close it off the Explorer so we have some code. And we're looking at creating, expanding, copying, and shrinking slices. So the first thing to do is to say, let's create a slice variable and print it up. And you should expect that length is zero and the type is in slice. And that is exactly what we get, an empty array because our slice is nil, but Golang and the print function is smart enough to know that the type of it is a slice. So even though it's not pointing to a valid array, we can say that it's empty. Let's now initialize this slice from an array. And now we have created a slice from an array and save it in S0. And of course, if we rerun this, since our array we're pointing to has 10 elements, the thing that we're looking at though in this lecture is how do we create a slice that has a valid array without us first having to create an array. So let's imagine that we had a function that made and returned a slice. We know that how we can return slices. So let's write a function that actually take a number and return a slice. Okay, so I'm cheating a little bit. I pass the size that we want here, even though my function actually said 10, but maybe I don't really want to specify how big the arrays is in the function name. So I would like to ideally pass the size in and have the function make array of that size, slice it and return it. Well, there's a problem. When I'm creating an array, I can only use constant. I cannot use a variable. So this is not allowed. I'll get an error. It tells you that this length needs to be a constant. So obviously having a function that takes a variable as the size of the array to create is not going to work. So I really do need to pass the size. And if I'm going to pass the size in the name of the function, or at least hint at it, I really don't need to pass any parameter. And so now I can say, well, my function make slice 10 of int can do this. And now I can sort of create a slice S1. 
and no error so far so let's run this and look at that they're both the same i can prove to you that uh, we're getting a new slice every time because what i'll do is i'll modify an element in slice one and then repeat the same thing i will see that our two slices are different the values are different for each one of the slices. But this seems cumbersome and not too scalable because every time I want a slice of a certain size, I'll have to write a function for that slice. So if now I imagine that I want a slice of 20 elements or even five, then I have to write a function that can just create an array of five, slice it and return it. So I'll remove this piece of code because we know that all the slices are all different. So I will need to keep that. So now I have this other slice, but now I want this to be a slice of five hints. And of course, if I run this, we should expect this to work also. And it works. So what is going on? Why am I going through this? I'm trying to show that if I wanted to create slices dynamically, I could sort of do it right in my own function that return a slice. Fortunately for us, we don't need to do that. Go is taking care of this for us. A Go has what's called a built-in function called make. And so we can simply call make, and we don't have to implement it. We can simply call make and tell it the type of slice that we want to create. So in this case, I want a slice of int. And how many elements I want? Let's say 10. Here, I want a slice of int again, and maybe I want five. Here, I want, let's say, a slice of currency. Well, I don't have the currency type yet, but let's create that, a type called currency, and I can create a slice of that type also. And maybe I want seven of those. And let's store a value. Well, maybe we can store a value. Okay, so I'm simply using multiple assignment. And now if I rerun our code, there you go. I have created slices of the different types. Slice of main that currency saying that though, this type was defined in the main package. But notice the make function can make any of the slices and it could do something that I couldn't do, which was to create an anonymous array with a size that I give it dynamically. So the make is a built-in function. Say make a slice. We know that it's pointing to an anonymous array and we can use it. So far, what we've just done is create slices at runtime using the make function. That takes care of creating slices at runtime. The other thing we want to understand is how do we expand slices? How do we add values to it? One of the things that we have with an array is that the size is fixed. So once you create an array of 10 or whatever, you cannot add any more element to that array. If you create an array of 10 elements and at runtime you realize that you do have one more element you'd like to store on an 11th element, well, sorry, no place to put it in that array. However, slices are not as inflexible as array. Even though they are backed up or the underlying storage for a slice is an array, we can see because it's anonymous, we can actually swap it out. And let's take a look at that now. No surprise here from what we've seen before, what if we wanted to append a value to this slice that currently does not have any underlying storage? Keep that in mind, no underlying storage, but I still want to grow it anyway. So I'll use the append function, which is a built-in function, just like the make function and the length function. Let's grow slice four by adding a string value. What I've done is said, use the append function to append the string value to slice four. Now, if you think about it for a minute, if we have slices and we need to append them, sometimes it might mean changing or swapping out the underlying array. In this case, our slice four does not have an underlying array. So if we happen to change it or have to grow it for whatever reason in order for us to accommodate adding values to it, we will lose access to that new slice that was created. So for that reason, when you use the append function, the usage is always going to look something like this. After we have appended to it, let's print out the value and the length. And notice, at first, our slice was empty, the length was zero. Now, our slice is no longer empty, and the length is one. When we created our slice, it did not have storage, but now it does. So let's append yet another value to our slice and print it out. And of course, we should expect that we now have two values after this call to append and the length of our slice should be two and that's exactly what we have we have new york chicago as values in our slice and the length of our slice is two 
Now, if you look at the signature of the append function, you'll see that oh, it actually takes more than one value. We can see this if we copy this. And there we go. It says it takes a slice of some type and any number of values. Those are variadic values. And it, of course, return a slice of that same type. That tells us that we can pass more than one string value. And now let's run our code and see the result. And as you can see, our slice has grown to accommodate the multiple values we have provided. So now we know how to expand slices. The next thing we want to look at is how to copy slices. And for that, you can imagine that if we have a slice, let's say we want to copy it to S5, this is a shallow copy. And we know it's a shallow copy because we can modify values using S5 and it would still modify the same array that S4 points to. So let's take a look. And let's modify a value using S5. I should modify it first before I try printing it out. And as you can see, both S4 and S5 are pointing to the same arrow. So this is a shallow copy. This is not what we mean when we say we want to do a copy of a slice because we know this is how it works already. So this is not what we want. We want to see how to do deep copy. So I start off now, I will make a slice called S6 and it can only hold three string values. Now I want to make a copy from S4 to S6. So S6 is my destination. And if you look at the signature of the copy function, you'll see it says destination slice and then the source slice. There are no return values. So that's S6 and S5, for example, or S4, it doesn't really matter. And so what is the expectation? At this point, what we know will happen is that we expect some of the values from S5 to be copied to S6. Now, since the length of S5 is five, what happens since S6 is only three? Will it grow S6 to make room for the additional values from S5. Well, let's run it and see. And as you can see, no, it did not. So we can see is if your destination is less than the source, well, it only copy as much as can be stored in the destination. And this works the other way too. If your destination is larger, well, then it only copy as much elements from the source. So we can try that also. And now we'll make a slice that is larger than the source, which we'll call, say, seven elements. And of course, we should only expect that five elements should be copied into our slice and the remainder elements should be empty. And since we don't actually have a way to see empty strings, maybe we should put something in there to show it. And what we should expect is because this is at offset four and we're saying that our source slice S5 has five elements, I should expect LO to be overwritten, but the fifth and sixth element shouldn't be overwritten. And as you can see, that is exactly what happened. We overwritten the first five elements, but the one that says world and nice, those are not overwritten. So no problem if your source or destination have different sizes. Of course, the key thing to note here is that we had to create that destination slice first before we call the copy function. The copy function did not create storage for us like our append function would do. Now, notice how we were able to grow a slice from nil, an empty slice. It works the same way if our slice already has values. As you can see, when our slice already has values, we can still append to it. So I showed you the extreme of starting with an empty slice and growing it. When we try to assign to an empty slice, we had an exception, an out of bounds error. But our append function tests that the slice that we're trying to append the value in, if it's empty, it just simply grows it. So that's why we do not have out of bounds when we try to add a first element to a slice that's empty. Because we know that append will create a slice for us if we have a nil slice, we can actually use that to make a copy of a slice without first having to create a slice. So let's see if we can create a slice that's the same length as slice seven without having to do make slice first. So how might we do that? We want a copy of all the elements in slice seven, but we do not have enough space in slice eight 
to store those values. We know this, so let's run it. And copy was smart enough to say, well, that's nil, there's no place, it's empty. There's no place to copy the element from seven. And so just like it wouldn't overflow, same reason if it's empty, it wouldn't copy any values. So how then can we get all the elements of seven into eight without first having to make a slice that has underlying storage? We can use the append function. And our append function takes a variadic parameter. It doesn't take a slice, but we already know that if we have a slice and we expand it from our previous lecture, we can now pass those values from the slice to a variadic function. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to expand the values from slice 7 and pass in the nil slice 8. We know that append will create enough storage and return it. And there you go. So slice 8 now is a true copy of seven. And it was a short end to be able to use this because then it just saves us the extra step of saying, make a slice of some size. So this is another way in which we can have a deep copy using the side effect of the append function ability to create storage for us. So now let's talk about shrinking. So to be truthful about it, Go doesn't have any way of actually shrinking a slice. And think about what it really means to shrink a slice. If you have a slice and you want to shrink it or an area you want to shrink, well, we've been using copy and specifying the sort of where we want to copy from. Well, one of the things that we haven't covered yet, but we'll see now is that you can re-slice a slice. So for example, here I have slice seven and eight, which are like copies of each other. They have how many? Seven elements. Let's say I wanted to shrink that. Well, I can create a shorter slice, of course, a window into that underlying array by re-slicing a slice. And if I want to do a copy, well, we know how to do that. So first, let's create a window into the underlying anonymous array using a slice. So maybe I do not want these first two values, but I want Charlotte and San Francisco. That represents offset one and a length of two. So let's slice that slice into that. So offset one, so zero, one, actually two, because I don't want zero and one, but I want from Charlotte. And the length is two, so two plus two is four. So that's all I'll specify that. And let's print it out and see if we get what we expect. And there you go. Slice nine points to the exact same array as slice eight, that anonymous array. It's an anonymous array, but we were able to re-slice slice eight to get a new slice. So not only can you slice an array, but you can re-slice a slice. But now slice nine actually points to the same array as slice eight. So if we modify slice nine or the elements of slice nine, in other words, it will modify the elements that slice eight points to. What if we wanted to create a new array that is just a part of slice eight? Well, we know how to slice a slice. So we can simply use this side effect from the append function that we used earlier to have a smaller array. So slice 10, and let's say we wanted to just have those two elements from slice nine, or maybe some different elements. We can do slice eight. And now I'm saying I want maybe from four to the end of that array, let's do it that way. And that's a slice. Remember, I re-slice a slice, and now I expand it using the expand operator. And since 10 is empty, the append function will just create an anonymous array, copy those values into it, and then return a new slice for me. That's essentially shrinking that slice, but I don't shrink the original slice. Remember, you cannot modify an array. The size of an array cannot change once it's created. And when we have slices, that's what we're doing. We're still using arrays. The only difference is whether we create that slice from an existing array we create or we use the make function to create an anonymous array but it's still an array we can never change the size of that underlying array we can change the view of it by reslicing that size which is what we did for slice nine or we can create a new slice based off a slice of that array using the append function or even copy function. So we could have used copy if we had said slice 10 is equals to make and you know we actually make a big enough array and then of course we can use copy. So you have all these different ways in which you can create a new either view with a slice or a new slice with its own storage represent part of the original slice 
either use an append or copy. Keep in mind, all of this just simply means that you cannot change the length of an array, but you can get around it using the combination of append and copy. If this doesn't make sense to you, rewatch the video, check out the reading assignment, and try the exercise. Let's take a look at what's available for reading assignment. I have already pointed to the language specification on slice type and slice expression. Today, I am adding making slices and maps and channels. The make function can make these three things, but since we haven't covered maps and channels yet, once you read the material on make, just sort of sticks to the examples of slices and ignore anything that mentioned map and channel. The other thing is the append and copy function. You can read that part of it in the language specification also. And if you haven't yet, definitely check out Go Slices Usage and Internal from the Golang blog. Okay, that's it for this lecture. Take care, see you in the next and final lecture for this section. Let's take a look at what your exercise is for this week. So for this week's exercise, what you will do is you will implement your own copy function. If you think that a copy function is hard to implement, give it a try, think about it, write it down on paper, and then think about how you might implement it. If you still can't get it, of course, look at the solution, but that's what you need to do. You just implement a function called my copy string slice, and basically this is the type it works on. And I have already written some code to test your copy function. The function is called test my copy string slice, and it will exercise your copy function. Here's the code for test my copy function, and it's at the bottom here, and you don't need to really worry about it. Once you run it, it's going to check and see if your copy function returns the correct value. The next to do you have is to implement your own append function. If you think about how append work based on just playing with it and seeing how we're able to grow things with append, to test that your append function work, I create a slice variable s that's nil, I call your append function to append a string value. If your append function is implemented correctly, I should get back a new slice that has an array link suitable to store this value with this value stored. And if it works correctly, I should be able to call it with these variadic parameters and have it return the appropriate slice. And if I print that out, now I should have this as my printout value. This is gonna allow you to get comfortable with using append and copy if you can try and implement it. That's it for your exercise. Welcome to section three, lecture six. And today we will start the review or the wrap up of section three. Now remember, in our review, we cover some of the things that we left out in earlier lectures on purpose, or we pick up miscellaneous things that wouldn't have made sense from other section until we cover a certain type of material. You'll see two examples of that in this review. First, we'll be talking about program arguments. You wouldn't have understand program arguments until you understand slices. And so the place to really cover program argument would have been in section one, where we talk about the anatomy of a Go program. But since we didn't cover slices and array, well, I couldn't really talk about program arguments. But now that we know slices and arrays, we can go back and sort of review that little piece of material. We will cover that in part one of this review. Now, why parts? Well, because this review is sort of a little bit long and there are a number of things to cover and they're sort of all a little bit different, we'll just break it up into parts. You will not have a exercise or lab for each part. The only reason for the parts is so that we can break up the review. So in part one, we will be talking about program arguments. We can talk about that now because we've covered arrays and slices. In part two, we'll look at array slices of arrays and slices. Now, what does that mean? Well, basically we will be talking about multi-dimensional arrays and slices. In part three, we'll talk about slice capacity. How is it possible to resize a slice? It's because of capacity. Finally, in part four, we'll talk about string slices. Yet another example of something we couldn't cover when we talk about strings in section two, but we had to leave to sometime like now, since string slices, like it says, are slices that you can create from strings. And it would not have made sense to try and cover that when we cover string because we did not know anything about array or slices. So it would have been difficult to try and cover that material or at least confusing at best. 
Now that we have an outline for the four parts of this review, let's get started. First thing we're going to look at are program arguments. So what are program arguments? When you type go run main that go, you're passing two arguments to the program go. And those arguments are additional information the go program needs in order to run correctly. As you remember, we can say things like go get, go install, go build. Those are other things that alter or change the behavior of the Go program. So the Go program is written in such a way that it will test for these arguments and based on which command you pass in the second place after the Go command, it knows which subcommand it should run and then depending on that, it knows what to do with the remaining things that you pass. Program arguments are provided to you by the OS package. So let's just print out that value and see what type it is. So now what we've written a little bit of code. I'm not worried about printing out the value of OS args yet, and you'll see why in a minute. So let's run our program now and see what we get. The type of OS.arg is a slice of string. So since it's a slice of string, why don't we just iterate over it and print out each value or element of that slice and see what we're getting. So this should now print out all the values in this OS.arg slice of string and tell us, well, at which position in that slice they occur. So where's that arg of zero? Is this very long, weird looking name and it ends with main. Now let's run it again. Looks like these numbers are changing. So what is going on? When we type go run, it is compiling for us our application main that go and it's calling it main in this weird directory path and then it's running it. And that's why every time we run it, we get a different directory name, but we can build our application. So after we build our application, now we have this main executable. We could see that if you're on a Linux type operating system, you can type main and main that go, for example, and it tells you that oh, one is an executable and one is a text file. Okay. And my shell is coloring the executable main with red, telling me that oh, I can run it. So let's just run that. And notice how arg0 now is this rather sensible string. And it's the name of my application. And it says that I run it from the current directory. So this is just one element in this array for now. What about if I change the name of my executable? So instead of calling it main, let's just call it awesome app. So I've changed it from test to awesome. That's the name of my app. And then now I run it. I have to run it because my current directory is not in my path. So I have to say that forward slash. If I just type awesome alone, it would look at my path. And since my current directory is not in my path, I wouldn't get to execute it. And so notice, with regards to what name I give this application, when I run it, Go takes that name and it assign it to the first element of that args, where's that args slice of string. And now it's available within my application. What about if I imagine that I pass some other option, just like we would pass to the Go program, like run main that Go. And there you see those arguments. This is the first one at the zero offset followed by one, two, and so on. And this happens regardless of what you pass. When you pass arguments to a program, Go is not in any way validating or doesn't care what you type. So for example, I can type hello world. And all it does is it passes that to my program. In no way what you pass as an argument has to tie to anything that exists. You can pass anything you like and that gets passed to your program. The only thing you need to know is how these are passed. And as you can see, it's a slice of string. So you know that much the type of it already. But now I type hello world and it shows up as two different arguments. What if I wanted that to be just one argument? Well, I can enclose it in single quotes or double quotes. And there's a slight difference between single quotes and double quotes. So let's do double quotes first. When I enclose a set of words in double quotes, they pass as one parameter. So that allows me to pass much longer things than just a word. Well, why might you want to use single quote? Well, let's do this. So there's this program called echo. Let's do go path. And my go pass is set to this currently. If I put this as part of my string, you can see that go path is being expanded by my shell before it's passed to my application. So the value of this go path environmental variable has nothing to do with go itself in terms of our application. This is on any operating system. If you're on Windows, instead of using a dollar sign, you use a percent at both ends. So percent in front, a percent at the end. That's to evaluate the value of the environmental variable. So if I enclose this, however, in single quote, notice what happened. There's no expansion or variable substitution. The other thing you need to know is, let's say, for example, I wanted to pass numbers to my 
program. So I want to say awesome should be given you know, number three, 3.145, and the Boolean value true. Now we know that all of these are just string. It shows up right here. We know we have a slice of string, so these must be string. So the only thing we need to know now, can we or how can we convert our parameters or our arguments to our programs to the type that we expect or the type we want? So for that, Go provides you the string convert package. It's strconv, and we can use that to convert strings to or to parse different type of values, numeric, boolean, and so on, from strings. So let's do it. And if I remember correctly, it was the third. So what is that arc three? That was our boolean value. Now, as I was typing parse bool, as you can see here, it takes a string that has any of these things. If it has one, t, lowercase, uppercase, or through, all these combination of how you can specify true or false, it would parse that into a boolean value. But notice what it's returning. It returns two values. It returns the value that is parsed or an error. Of course, if it returns an error, you should ignore the value because it means that it incorrectly parses it, and you should expect that to be the default value, which is false. So you definitely want to test to make sure that, oh, let's say you take an argument and the user is supposed to pass a Boolean value in the fourth argument. Well, it, you want to test to make sure they did that in fact. So let's print this out. I'm not going to test it. I'll simply just print it out. So let's run. And you can see, I have to build my application. Go build. I have to move it from main to awesome. Override it, yes. And so now you can see my bull through is type, and that's the value true, and the type of it is false. And I can specify on the T, I can specify one, because I'm parsing that as Boolean. I can specify zero, parsing that as Boolean is false. And as you can see, and the error is nil. What if I pass something? that cannot be parsed as a Boolean, for example, three. Notice how we get an error in the conversion. So that's one reason why you'd want to test that. And similarly, we can parse the numeric types, so integer, or float. So let's see an example of that. So my float, if I remember correctly, that was argument two because this was the offset for it. So we should be able to run that now. And of course, we still have an error for our Boolean type here, but let's fix that. Oh, again, I need to build. So let's do go build main. And this time, let me just don't worry about renaming. And there we go. So I've parsed my, where's my float? Oh, I didn't change the function. Oh, notice how oh, to parse a float is very different. We want to pass the string. We want to pass how many bits we want to represent that floating point value that we will parse from the string. But the type of the value we always get back is 64. So that means we can only pass either 32 or 64 here, even though we always get back a 64-bit value. What that means is if we parse a float from a string, and that float can be represented as a really, really big number, like requiring 64 bits, if we restrict it to just 32 bits, then we will be restricting the size of the value that we parse from the string, but it still be returning a 64-bit value. Does that make sense? All right. So hopefully, if not, just read the documentation for string convert and these parse methods. So we want to parse float the string, and I'll say 32 bits because I don't need 64 bits to represent that's such a small floating point number, 3.145, blah, blah, blah. So let's do this. Again, have to build. Okay, there we go. And notice how my float is an approximate value. It's not the exact value, but I got to parse it anyway. Keep in mind that floating point numbers are very, very difficult to be exact. So they are usually approximation. And that's when you do calculation with floating point number. You want to use the highest precision possible and then think about how you truncate the value when you print it out. So for example, if I really want that to print to be close to what we really want, I should do maybe three decimal places because that's what the value specify at three decimal places. And I'm going to remember that I have to build this time and rerun it. And oh, that's only three. So I want four, four values actually. I have to build again, forgot that time. And now you can see that once I run it up and I get close to what I specified, but just sort of keep that in mind when you use floating point numbers. Okay, so we have quite a bit more. We have already spent a bit of time on just program arguments alone, but at least now you know what program arguments are. 
you know how to convert different values from string and this is going to be important for your exercise so do keep that in mind and pay attention if you don't get this yet please go back and rewatch this section of the video and of course the documentation for welcome to section 3 lecture 6 all right the next thing we said we wanted to look at are multi-dimensional arrays and slices in this illustration i want to start with just an array because whatever we say for array is mostly going to be true for slices so let's just stick to arrays so let's say I have a seven element array and it doesn't matter what I'm storing in that array. I type that as a row. What I mean by that is I create a new type called row, which represents the seven element array. And so as you can imagine, that is simply type row is an array of seven elements. And let's say I had to specify a type. So let's say I use int, but as we know, it could be anything. What about if I want to create variable that contain multiple rows? Well, since I have a type representing one row, I can now create another array that is a three element array of type rows. I remember rows, a type I've already defined to be an array of seven elements. So what you might imagine is that I have one row followed by another row, followed by another row, but each row itself is seven element array. And so each row can be indexed, has its own index, like index zero, index one, index two. And those would be the outer index that allow you to get to the individual row in my multi-row variable. And then once I have and row, then I can access each individual element of that row. So this is where the multi-dimension comes from because you can see there are two sets of indexes here I'm dealing with. So to help drive this home a little bit more, let's imagine that once I have declared my multi-rows variable, let's say I'm interested in this element. We can say we're ignoring or we don't care about all the other rows except row one. And within row one, we do not care about all the other elements except the one at index four. So how might we access this element using this variable multiple rows to either store a value or get a value? And that is very easy. We simply say multiple rows of one because multiple rows represent a array of rows. So index and multiple rows will give you a row. And so we want the one at index one. And then once we get that, we want the element at four. And so that represents this item, this element within row one at offset four. And so we can store that or the value of it. That's what we retrieve in this case, but it's easy to imagine we can store something there. We can imagine that if we have rows, they don't have to go across the page. That's one way of thinking of it logically, but we can think of them being stacked on top of each other. In that case, our rows still have index index zero and one, that doesn't change. It's just logically how we want to think of them. Within each row, we still have the offset for each. Now, if we look at this, this looks like a table. And so we can say we create a new type called table and it's just an array of three elements of rows. And this doesn't look very different from when we create a variable of rows. If we can think of things as table, what we can start thinking about is really just rows and columns. And so just like how we imagine we can just find a row and iterate all the elements of that row, we can think about how can we iterate over the columns of a table. So let's say we're interested in summing up or calculating the average or just looking at all the elements in column two. We can say, well, all we're interested in is column two. And while we iterate over the rows, we just access elements for each one of those rows in column two only. And that gives us a way to just look at that slice of the table. Let's now jump to our code and play with this a little bit. So now we're looking at multiple dimension, right? And so what we said was, let's imagine that we had a type for a row. In this case, we'll just make it int. Now we can also create a type for a table to represent a table. We can access the different elements of this row and table. So let's create a variable now of this. Table one is just a table. And since we're doing with array, we know that though this is gonna come and be initialized with their zero value. So we can print it out if we want, but we know what it's gonna be. So let's assign a value to it. So, okay, so I've simply created a table, a variable of a table, add one value to that table in some location, and now I will print that table out. So let's run this and see what we get. Okay, so index out of range. Well, why am I getting index out of range? Table row, oh, my table row is seven element. My table three rows. If I do table of four, that should give me the middle table. And then four should allow me to access the fifth element of that table, which I want to assign to be seven. And it's telling me that I am indexed out of range. 
um, line 18. Oh, that's because we are trying to use our args and that's where we get no problem. So maybe for now, let's see, should we run our program with additional args? Let's do it. Let's um, put three, 3.145 and T for three. Okay, so that still works. So, okay, so we get in the arguments to our program. We get in this rather long, weird name because we're not building, but at least it now allows us to get to our table example. And as you can see, this is our outer table with three rows, each row being its array of itself. And then we were able to access the fifth element of that second row, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the fifth element. So we know that that's work. Why don't we create a function then that can initialize a table for us with some random value and maybe we can print it out. Okay, so let's see, where am I getting a... All right, problem. <laughs> my type is scope to my main function. So let's put that out above here. So I can be used other places and I'll do this. Okay, that's much better. I just remember from dealing with arrays that since my init table function here returns an array, it will be copied. Okay, so let's run our code and let's see what we get. And there's our value going across the screen, but maybe we want a nice function to print this out, not going across the screen, but like a table, like we said, if we intend this to be a table, we should probably print it out like a table. I think we can just copy this code and reuse it. And so instead of assigning a value this time, we actually want to print out the value and Maybe if we print it out like this, we'll have one value after the other and it wouldn't look very nice. So we can test it and we'll see. And so that doesn't look nice at all. We have all zeros and so on. So one thing we need to do at the end of printing our last value is go to a new line. Let's see, each row, at the end of each row, so this represents a processing of one row. So the end of each row, we need a new line. Start on another new line because we want to print this as a table. And we actually don't need to print out anything, but at least this is starting in the right direction. And I suggest that you do it in this way, piece by piece, see the result and then change it. This is gonna be important for your exercise. Maybe we wanna put a space between each element by printing out the element followed by a space. And if we rerun that, that looks like that. So we're sort of getting there, there but the values are not aligned because they're different values and so on. So maybe this is not the best way. Maybe what we want to do is spacing of five. And so now if we rerun this, wait a second, this padded pads our thing with five, that's not what we want, more like this. And so now our values are aligned. So this look a lot better. And if we want, we can do heading for our table and so on. So you'll see an example of that in the exercise, but imagine printing out a heading and you can put them below and so on. So, so now you see multidimensional array. What if we wanted to change this to multidimensional slices? Well, the flexibility with slices is that we can have uneven tables. So what I mean by that is if you did a slice of slice, you can do a slice of array and let's do that first. Let's do a slice of array. So instead of this being three, we'll say a table is just a slice of rows. And now, in order to create a table, what we need to do is if we have a variable table, this is now just a slice. This would fail because we cannot access any element of that table slice because this is just an empty slice right now. It doesn't point to any underlining array. So we need to dynamically create an underlining array or if we create an array and slices. But of course, if we are doing slices, now we know to make slices at a runtime. What we want to say is we want to make a slice of rows and how many of them do we want we want three so create an underlying array of some length and arrange for it to be sliced in the way that would give us a window into three elements of that and this array is type rows so now that we have that this still works of course when it comes to in a table we're still using the table which is a slice so why don't we just move this then since we're making table with different sizes dynamically why don't we move this into our init table so we put this here and instead of three we'll make this a parameter that we pass in and so if we want to create a table with here let's do four 
and here we'll not use this but instead use in a table and let's say three and we still access that element and of course we need to assign that value here so now our table one uses in a table so let's run this and see if our program blows up and it still works we could run this several times and because we're now overwriting that value here it's always going to be seven but we're doing with two tables so maybe we can say that before you print a table, you put an editing on it or something like I was saying before to separate it. So my heading is just gonna be a line, but you can do whatever you want. So now we've converted our table to be a slice, but that still doesn't get to what I was saying before. What I was saying, since we have table is a slice of row, then each row can be a different size element if we made row a slice. So right now, since we're doing a slice of row, each element of table is a seven element array. But if we wanted that to be different, we can create an uneven table by doing something like this and saying a row is just a slice of int. And if we do that, then we could have in a table take another set of values that represent, well, if you want three rows, what is the size for each row? Now, this is going to be a little bit of a stretch. So let's first just make it the way we were doing it before, where we pass how many elements per row do we want. And so if we do that, then uh, let me take out this for now and say that this could be five. And when we create a table, we'll create a table, which is a slice of row. But now for each element of that table, we need to create a new slice. So uh, before I initialize it, for example, I will say T of I is currently an element of that table, but it's also a slice, but it doesn't have a underlying array that we can store anything. So we have to make that. And so this is a slice of int, but how big is this? It is the second parameter, which we can call columns, for example. So now my init table takes two integers. So let's rerun this and see and it should still work and it does and as you can see i can use the same init table function to create tables with three rows and seven columns wide or four rows and five columns wide right and so you can vary this but i still want some more flexibility in terms of creating uneven number of records per row so let's imagine that my first parameter say how many rows and then my second parameter was to describe how many elements per row well, if I want to do that, well, I need to pass individual values to represent the different sizes for each row. So that tells us that we can use a variadic parameter. So if column here was a variadic parameter instead, then when I write to do make for the height row, I simply have to iterate over and get the value of that corresponding column. So it's going to be whatever I is because my column here should match the exact same number of rows. So the number of column value I have should match the number of rows, right? So that should be fairly easy. I should be able to do something like this. All right. And the other thing I need to do, of course, is pass variadic parameters, but I should do a check to make sure that the size of this is equals to the length of column is equal to the number of rows, because otherwise that my function would fail and crash. So if because we know variadic parameters are passes slice, right? So we can take the length. Then we want to return and let's do multiple return values now. So we want to return nil. So that's nil represent an empty slice and some error value, right? So we can create a new value. And so I need to say that I have multiple return values. We covered function with the type error and let's call this T. And so here I do not need to have a variable declare I can just say t is equals to make a row and of course we need to return multiple values so if everything is okay I'll return a row and error is nil when as we saw when there are no errors and of course I need to get the errors package so that's that so you can see I import errors package above there we go and error we have a problem here because now we return in multiple values and so for now I'm going to ignore errors because I know that I know that I'm not testing with invalid parameters. All right, so this should fail, but again, we're doing variadic functions, so we can pass seven, but this is not enough because size of this 
is going to be a slice, it's going to be one, which is different than this. So that should fail. We need to specify that three values here. And that those values represent how many columns per row. So we have three rows. So let's say our first row is seven. Our second row is four. And our last row is maybe five, for example. So that's one way to specify it. Next thing is we have four rows. So each column, let's say our first number of columns in our first row is five. The next one is two. The other one is five. And one is maybe three. The last one is three. And so with this, let's run our code now and see. Ah, so what is that now? Ah, let's see. In list, can it can only use data that with final parameter in list? Well, yes, is the final parameter. So let's go modify this, and it is the final parameter. So let's do int. Make sure we let it know that oh, that's the final parameter. So, and there we go. And notice how. Just as I said, once we use slices of slices, it gives you this flexibility of having uneven rows. And you can nest this as much as you like. So you can have, now that we have this type table, you can create another slice of table and, and keep going. And that's where, again, we are using two dimension where you can go to three, four, and in math, you have these higher dimension problems that you need to represent. And this is one way of doing it. And Go will give you the ability that if you want each row or sub element to be the same size, well, then just use array or you can specify it like we did. You could be still specified and can create each to be the same, or we can create to be different because slices give us the magical ability that the underlying array for a slice, regardless of what it, how many, still have the same type of slice of int, for example. Welcome to section three, lecture six. Okay, so the next thing we need to take a look at is reslice and slices. And so the question we want to ask is this. If I have an array, I know that I can slice it. And let's call that slice one. Now, what if I want a second slice called slice two that looks at a different part of that array? When we create the array, we can create the all these slices. We know that. But when we create a slice dynamically using the make function, remember that is an anonymous array. We do not have access to the array. So if we have a slice that was created dynamically or someone to give us a slice, even if they created that slice from an array, can we resize that slice that we have, assuming that we know that there are more elements in that underlying array to get a second slice? And the answer is yes. So just let's take a look. Now, there's more to this. It has to do with the capacity of the slice. And if you really want to understand this, I suggest that you read the goal line specification, but let's see what's going on. So for us to resize a slice, we need some data. So let's start off by making an array and let's say we create a slice from it. So now we have a slice one that we've created from this array. And I'm not going to print it out because we all know what this is going to do. The question is, can I create a second slice, slice two, using slice one? So I'm printing it out now only because I want us to be able to compare the two. So if this doesn't crash, then it means that we can do it. And I'm saying we can do it. So let's run it and see. And as you can see, slice one was from the beginning of the array to up to the fifth element. And the length of that slice, oh, I did not calculate the length. So let's rerun that again. I'm bugging a program. Uh, but no, percent V, uh, oh, okay. All right, so that's correct now. Let's rerun it. What did I miss up? Index out of range. Where is that coming from? I did not pass enough parameters. So now we get it. Slice one, five elements. Notice slice two, two elements, and different element that we can access in slice one. As we know, slice one, the valid index from the length is 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Those are the five elements we can access. So how is it then that we're able to say we want to create a slice 2 using element 6, which is beyond where the slice 1 is valid? And also, we want to slice this up to 8. But so long as the, on the slice has the capacity, we can re-slice a slice to include that extra capacity. One of the things we cannot do is go to an earlier element in that slice. So for example, using slice two, we can create a third slice slice three, but we cannot go back to accessing elements that were, for example, in slice one. Again, for this to make sense, definitely do some extra reading if you're interested, but since this is an introductory to go lang, we cannot cover everything. So short answer is you can re-slice a slice to get another slice, but there's certain limitations and it sort of gets involved. So I just wanted to show you that. 
The final thing we have to do is revisit strings. So if you remember, this is a string and it just basically means a number of characters. And if you look at it, now that you know array, it looks very much like an array. A string looks like an array. The string we want to look at though is a string that has some Chinese characters. And the reason why is when we looked at strings earlier, to encode some of these characters that couldn't fit in eight bits, we needed a few more bits. So if we think of a string as a set of bytes, now we can see that we have the characters, which are here we can see broken out, including the space. We have the byte value, which we looked at. We said, for example, that Chinese character for world, each character takes up three bytes, but those are the byte index. And if we try to access the string using the index, when we say the length of a string, we get how many bytes, and therefore that looks like an array. So we can iterate over that string using each byte index. But these are the characters we would get instead. We'll get characters that represent those bytes, but we won't get the character from the string. And so S4, for example, give us the character we expect, zero, but let's say we do S10, we get something very different. That's because we're only looking at the bytes. When you iterate over, you do length of a string, get in this case 13, and then you start index those individual location, you're getting the bytes of the string. But what if we do range over a string? What do we get? In that case, what we get are the room value. And if you remember, the room value is a 32-bit value that represents a character. And so the index now for those runes is very, very different when we do range. So let's jump back into code so we can see this. Talking about it doesn't really make as much sense as if you see it in code. So let's grab our string that we want to play with. And as we said, if we take the length of this string, so L, we should expect 13. And there we go. We have the string, we have the length is 13. Even though we see very clearly that there are only how many characters? One, two, three, four, five, six. This is the sixth character. Space is seven. And then two more, which are nine characters. But yet, the number of bytes we need to represent these nine characters is 13. And as we saw, each one of these characters requires three bytes. Okay, so one way is to iterate, like I said, over the string as a slice of bytes. So we can do that. So now I know the length. So it it over that length and visit each one of those values of this string. And when we try to access a string like this, I'm saying that what we get in is the byte value. So actually let's print out the type also. And notice this is uint8. And when we covered types, we said that uint8 byte was just an alias for uint8. So using the word byte is just another way of saying u int 8. So each one of these is a byte and those are our 13 byte values. What about if we said range instead? If we say range over s and give us the index, now we have s of i and of course the type. So let's print that and see. And notice the difference. Now our index is very different. Once it gets to seven, it's not a skip and it's smart enough to know when to skip and how to skip. But here's the problem. Because we're using that i to index into s, we're still gonna always see it as a byte. So what we really want to do is when we range over, have the range return the value for us. And that is what we want to use. And notice the difference. Now we can see that each one of these in 32, or what did we say? Well, when we look at rune, we said that a rune is a 32-bit value. And now you can see the difference here, that these are 32-bit values. And of course, when we print them out, we have the 32-bit value. Of course, we could ask to print those out as characters this way, and we get the characters we expect. So very interesting now that you know about slices and strings. I call string the triple threat. And the reason why I say that is because you can take a string, treat it as a string, you can also treat it as a slice of bytes, or you can treat it as a slice of rune. A string as a slice of byte, string as bytes, get the type you want, string a slice of bytes, and then say you want to convert that string into a slice of bytes. Remember we do cast in. If you want string as a slice of rune, slice of rune, and cast the string to it. And so once we do this now, we can expect that the length of this SAB is going to be 13 because we've cast our string to be a slice of byte, and the length of SAR should be nine because we've cast our string to be 
a slice of rune and so it takes care of knowing how many bytes we need for each of those characters so we should expect 13 and 9 and that is exactly what we get and so we can go back and forth if we have some bytes and we want to see them as string well just say that you want string and turn those into bytes so we can take our sab now which is a slice of byte and turn it into string and similarly take the slice of runes and turn them back into string also by simply doing this and so what i've done is take my slice of bytes cast them to a string uh, maybe i have an s2 somewhere already oh yes slice two let's call this st2 string two and let's call this string three and so i've taken my slice of bytes converted to a string if you know those bytes represent string, you can cast them to a string. And I take my slice of runes and convert them to a string also. And we can print out again. Here, the length of the string is gonna be 13 because once it's a string, that's the length, there's a number of bytes. So here we get the number of bytes, but we should see that they both print the same way. And they do. Let's start by taking a look at lab exercise. So in this lab, you will implement a function to correctly reverse the characters in a string. And here are some example string and what they look like when they're reversed, if you put an input. You don't have to worry about writing the test function because I've written that for you here. So with this test function, I want you to just come and click on run. If test one was, if I give it hello world, I get back this. Test two, I give it hello world in Chinese, and it gets back that. And notice how there's some Spanish and these accented characters and they have to be reversed also. The other thing I would recommend as a tip is to use pen and paper and just draw out on paper what logically you think an array look like or area strings. And then try to imagine if you had to reverse it, what would that look like? Don't go for clever, just go for something that works. Let's take a look at lab exercise two. In lab exercise two, your task is to compute the letter grade for a set of test scores. And so the program will start out by prompting the user to enter how many test scores they have. If they enter zero, the program exit, no problem. However, if they enter a number greater than zero, you have to prompt them repeatedly to enter the test scores. Test scores in this case, I said they're just integers. Once you get all the test scores, what you need to do is calculate the average test score and then print out a letter grade. Exercise three is gonna be built on exercise two essentially. Instead of prompting a student to enter all the scores, what you'll do instead is accept as your program argument four parameters. The first is gonna be the number of students in a class and must be greater than zero. If it's not, then you should print an error message and tell the user why, and the program should exit, allowing them to rerun the program. The second parameter should be the number of exam per term, and the fourth and final parameter is the name of the class. The next thing you want to do is generate some random test score for each student. Remember, they would have told you each student, how many exam per student. So now you have an idea of how many test scores you need to generate, and you can use input that get ran int. And of course, you're gonna generate some random numbers, which are gonna represent test score for the students. The minimum possible value on a test, we're gonna say is 30. So that should be pretty straightforward for to do one. Once you can get that and print it out, now you want to print things out nicely. And here, you're gonna print a report. Your report should include the class name, which was entered as a parameter to the function, and for each student, their test score, and of course, the letter grade. And then for each test, you wanna print the average score for that test. So let's take a look at my solution and see what it looks like. Let's say I wanna do 10 students per class, maximum of three exam, and max score is 100. And this is a math class, for example. And I run this and you can see student one, these are the test scores that got for the three exams, test one, test two, test three and their letter grade at the end. So you don't have to print it out exactly like this, but it must have the class and letter grade per student. So certain things must be there, the average score. So that gives you an idea of somewhat what the result should be for lab 03. Let's move on to lab four, fourth and final lab for section three. In this lab, you're gonna be using the program arguments. So for example, you'll call your program, let's say my underscore at, or pretty much anything, but you probably keep it simple. And you'd be able to pass three parameters. Notice these are three parameters to your program. First parameter, second parameter, 
and your third and final parameter to your program. What this represents, it's always going to be now plus, and then this is where the user is going to specify how long they want to wait. So what is the at program? The at program, I put a link to it here. You can go look at examples on the internet, or if you're on a Linux slash Unix machine, you can test it. We want to write a simplified at program or simplified at program, which we'll call my at, for example. And also say something like my at now plus two seconds, which means two seconds from now. And the format of duration is from the go line times package. Okay. So definitely look up the documentation. I put a link here to it. And so let me give you an example of how you run this program and what it look like. And notice I provide some hints of which set of functions you can use. So let's say I was to run my program. And so I compile it by saying install minus O and I give it a name or you can use build. I get my program name and now I can say my at now plus two seconds. And it means that oh, I want to be reminded or I want the message that I'll print two seconds from now. So let's run that and see. So there's my at. And one of the things I can do is just simply say go build because I have it in a directory called my at. Golang is going to give it the name my at. And so now I can run it. So if I type my at and just run it like this, it gives me some useful help. That's not part of your requirement but feel free to add some help if you like. However, if I run it with the first example, which is now plus, and let's say I did not put the third required parameter, notice how I get an error. So if I don't give you enough parameters, I get an error. So plus, and let's say two seconds from now, and now it prompts me for the message. And I say, and once you enter, you wait, notice two seconds later, it prints out my message. And this can be used for anything. So I can say, for example, not only five seconds, but I can say two hours, 30 seconds, and two milliseconds if I wanted to. I don't want to wait that long. And if you look at the Golang documentation for the times package, you can see that you can specify any number of things. You can even specify addition of time duration. Keep it simple. Of course, you type in this and want to wait. So here you see an example of two minutes. Here is one hour. That is what your my at application is supposed to do. It's combining the ability of taking parameters, parsing it, making sure it's valid, and then using some of the things we know already, like if statement and so on, and combining that with your knowledge of using packages and being able to go look up the documentation for a package and use it.